My name is Ian Prowse and I'm a singer and a songwriter and a frontman. Uh, my first band of any note was called Pele in the 90s. Uh, we had a couple of albums out, we were signed to Polydor Records. And then I had, in the noughties, I had Amsterdam. And uh, for the past uh, 10 years or so, I've been putting out records under my own name. We did, um, when I had Pele, our second album, The Sport of Kings, we recorded with a guy called John Kelly. And John Kelly was off the back of making four albums with Paul McCartney. So when we'd finished our, we were at Rockfield Studios, and when we'd finished our sessions for the day, we'd go to the pub, two pints, tell me what it's been like making these four albums with McCartney, you know, before you'd done this with us. What was it like? What did he say about the Beatles? What, and John said exactly, the, John Kelly said exactly the same thing. He goes, you know, when all said and done, they were just a band out of Liverpool. They weren't, you know, they didn't come in on chariots from the, from the, the heavens or anything. They were, that's all they were, you know. What's it, Springsteen call them four Liverpool wharf rats, you know. And um, that's what they were. They were tramping these streets, playing their guitar and playing their music. But obviously the melting pot of their personalities meant that the standard of what they were doing was just really high, you know. And they, the competition element between the, the two boys especially was like, you know, we're onto something here as songwriters, but we can also spur each other onto something else as well. And then George is obviously watching all this, and he's, you know, the tide is rising. He's dragged up with the tide and all, so of songwriting abilities. Yeah, it was it was in, or very authentic in the way that songs come about, because there is a a magical element in in songwriting whereby one minute, uh, you know, say. Bridge over troubled waters doesn't exist, and then it it comes into being via something magical that the songwriter has no control over. He's a slave to the you know the arrival of of his muse and the music. It just comes out of nowhere, and it can't be it can't be uh, uh, called upon. You're a slave to it. You know it's not you know you're not telling the muse what to do. So I find that eternally fascinating. And um, we see it, don't we? We see it in where McCartney starts playing Get Back. And he's playing it on his bass. So he's, you know, he's, and that's an unusual thing. He's not, he's not writing this on his six-string guitar where there's all sorts of harmonics and melodies and everything going on. It's just a four-string bass and he's just playing the fifths. And he's just playing 12-bar. And all of a sudden, out pops this melody, which is only the verse melody. You don't, you don't get to see him then go into the chorus or anything. But uh, he just... And what the, the bit of utter talent is that he recognises that that's a good bit. Now, you know, he could have been busking away and hammering out stuff all day of other stuff which doesn't quite make it. But he, he knows that. And in his brain, he knows then that's the bit to edit. That's the bit that's going to be carried on, which is a germ of a good idea. Because mm -hmm. there's so much more to do in that song. There's no lyrics, you know. There's no chorus. There's no uh, the the the, uh, the keyboard bit hasn't happened. Lennon's guitar bit hasn't happened. So you've only got a little grain of of, of amazing um, imagination exploding, but there's ninety nine percent of perspiration still to go. And I think the the documentary shows that brilliantly. I th I think you know when you're watching the documentary at the beginning, you're struck by what shambles it is. All of the songs that you know so well, you know, I Got a Feeling, Don't Let Me Down. They start on Don't Let Me Down doing that call and response thing, which is an awful idea, but they have to take it right to the nth degree to realise that, you know, because the song is brand new. So, you know, the, the, so they're still trying out where they'll go with it. Uh, uh, so all the songs sound like a shambles, which is exactly how it is at every single band rehearsal for every band ever. It's noisy. It's a shambles. The band members are annoying each other by just noodling and playing and they won't shut up. I've got an idea. Uh, the, um, you know, they go to the toilet and come on, we're trying to do this. And all that stuff is there. So you can hear these songs and they get a, a little bit better when they do two of us and it's an electric thing. And it's kind of, you can tell it's not working. It, then they make, you know, a wise decision to put it acoustic and then it, it has its charm all of a sudden. So... This is, 
really authentic uh, version of what goes on in every band room all over the country, all over the world. But when they, they're honing it in and it's getting closer and closer uh, and then they go on the roof, that thing happens which all musicians will testify to is once somebody's watching you in a live scenario, once you're on the stage and you're being looked at, you find another, it's not an even t extra 10%, it's almost another mode of thinking that you are like on a war footing, you're on, you're on like all of your senses are arised and when they start playing on the roof is the best thing about the whole documentary for me because they sound fantastic you know you can imagine how they were cooking in Hamburg and at the cavern and all of that stuff um, they sound like what they were which is an absolutely magnificent rock and roll band. And they look happy don't they? They do and uh, on all of the songs they play you know uh, Dig a Pony and, and all the rest of the songs that they perform on the roof they nail them. They nail them because they're, that's what they, this is their proper natural habitat now, you know, playing rock and roll music. And, um, it, you know, I, the whole roof thing has always been looked upon as maybe not being that much of a thing and a, and a compromise from the other ideas that Paul had and everything. But I, actually, when you watch it, it's something else, the, the sound of them. There's just that thing that's going on. You can tell that the four of them are thrilled with Billy Preston. Um, and this is, again, something that happens in, with bands and musicians the world over, is that when somebody comes in and is all of a sudden playing another instrument to a high level, which complements every single song you're doing, it's, it really gives you a lift, you know, a, a musical lift and a spiritual lift. Because uh, all of a sudden you can hear your songs are going off to places that you, uh, you never imagined as the songwriter. And, uh, you know, I've had this myself when I've written a song and oh, it's okay. But then, you know, a violinist and a, and a whistle player will come in and all of a sudden the song comes alive and it, and it you know, it, it's a good song all of a sudden. And this is what happens with them. You can see them, you know, and Billy Preston just slides right in. And what he does, he's almost like the glue that glues them all together. You know, especially that's the traditional role of the Hammond organ instrument anyway on all rock and roll records. It's kind of the glue that fits all the other parts together. And he's playing the roads and everything like that. And um, I, it, if they'd have ever gone out on the road again, I imagine they would have taken him with them because he, uh, and he kind of tempered them all as well in terms of their, you know, their personalities and all, didn't they? They didn't want to be seen to be back in Liverpool being spiteful to each other well, Billy's there, you know. So, uh, yeah, it was great. Great moments in the, in the whole thing.